Hey everybody, Brian Allred, teaching pastor at New Life Presbyterian Church, and welcome back to our series on learning to love Leviticus, where today we are going to continue to forge ahead in this section, uh, covering chapters 17 through 26 on instructions for holiness. Uh, we're in the middle, actually not in the middle, we're nearing the end of this uh, second step of learning to love Leviticus. Remember the first step is uh, understanding the context of Leviticus, where it is redemptively in the story of God's uh, working of salvation for his people, as well as where it is in its literary context, in the middle of the Pentateuch, as well as where it finds its place in the Bible. Uh, the second step is learning or uh, uh, understanding the content of Leviticus. What do we actually find in the 27 chapters? And the third step, remember, is understanding the completion of Leviticus, which is understanding how this book points forward to and find its fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. And that's really unpacked in probably the most concentrated way in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Um, but obviously it's found throughout uh, the New Testament um, where we see how this book of Leviticus is pointing forward to the ministry and work of Jesus. <clears throat> but as I said, we are nearing the end of this section on instructions for holiness. Uh, we looked at the beginning of chapter 24, um, last week having to do with this con continuing concern for upholding holiness. Remember, chapter 23 uh, is a chapter that um, <clears throat> gives instructions for the appointments of all of these feasts or holy days that the Lord's requiring uh, for his people to observe. And of course, these feasts are not just an expression of the holiness of the people, how they acknowledge the Lord's hand and their provision, how they remember his redemptive events, but they also are ways where their holiness is further facilitated by remembering these things. They grow in holiness by per participating and remembering and acknowledging God's goodness in these feasts, but they are called to be holy people to participate in these feasts. And so in uh, chapter 24, there is this continuing concern for upholding um, holiness in their personal lives as a people. And then, of course, in chapter 25, I, I mentioned this in the last lesson, we actually get back to issues related to sacred time or holy days. Uh, really, there's not days there. At that point, it's really years. Uh, we read about the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee in Leviticus chapter 25. So here in chapter 24, we have these ongoing concerns of upholding holiness. And remember, there are two um, primary concerns here. Uh, two specific matters that are addressed in Leviticus chapter 24. Uh, the first part of the chapter in verses 1 through 9 has to do with maintaining the lamps and the bread in the holy place. And so that was the last lesson that we had. So you can go back and look at that. And today we want to look at um, the second half of the chapter, verses 10 through 23, that has to do with safeguarding the holiness of God's name. So one of the, one of the questions that um, is... It's hard to avoid as you're kind of reading through the book is why is this account here of this individual uh, who uh, curses and blasphemes God's name? Uh, not only why is it included in here, but why is it included where it is here in Leviticus chapter 24? Uh, it's actually one of two narrative sections in the book of Leviticus. If you're reading through the book of Leviticus, one of the reasons people have a hard time with Leviticus is it, it's not really telling a story. Again, there's a, there's a lot of laws, a lot of ritual um, and there's cultural distance uh, with these rituals, ideas of, of cleanness and uncleanness, the sacrificial system, uh, the consecration of a priest. So they all feel a little bit distant um, from us. And so it's hard for us to, to just read accounts of these regulations and requirements for the performing of these rituals uh, because it's not telling a story. There's not, there's not action. There's not movement. There's not plot. But there are two sections in Leviticus where we do read of narrative. <clears throat> and is it possible that these two sections are related? Well, that has been proposed. The first narrative section comes at uh, the beginning of chapter 10. So remember the layout of the book of Leviticus is you have uh, in chapters 1 through 7 all of these detailed instructions for sacrifices. Remember we read about the five different kinds of sacrifices that are spelled out there for the people to bring before the Lord. Uh, and then in chapters uh, 8, 9, 8 and 9, you read about the consecration of the priesthood. And then in chapter 10, you get this account of how Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, offer unauthorized fire before the Lord, and they are consumed by fire coming out from the Lord. So there's this warning against profaning God's holiness. That's actually in the text. The people will regard me as holy. And apparently there's something in the action of Nadab and Abihu 
that did not guard the holiness of God in the presence of the people. So there's this warning against profaning God's holiness uh, in the death of Nadab and Abihu by God. Remember, the Lord puts them to death. Fire comes out from the Lord. And now in chapters 11, really all the way through chapter 25, we have rules for um, maintaining cleanliness, uh, rules against uncleanliness and how to restore cleanliness once one has become unclean. And then you get all these instructions for holy living. Remember, rules for clean and unclean go from 11 to 15, chapters 11 to 15, Day of Atonement in chapter 16, and then the instructions for holiness, chapter 17, all the way through. Uh, really, I know it's 26 in the outline I've been showing you, but uh, when we get to chapter 26, you'll see that that's a very distinct chapter having to do um, with the sanctions regarding covenant obedience and disobedience. So really through 25, you get these instructions for holy living. And at the end of that, you get this other narrative section that warns against profaning God's holy name in the death of this blasphemer. He's put to death by the people. Um, remember that um, he's not a priest. So Nadab and Abihu were put to death by, were put to death by the Lord uh, as acting priests. Uh, this death or this blasphemer is put to death um, not by God directly, but by the people. Um, because he's not, apparently, because he's not a priest. So he's executed by the people. <clears throat> and so, again, you get these two narrative sections, both serving as warnings near the end of pivotal sections of the book. Of course, the problem with this um, is that it doesn't actually come at the very end of the section, uh, like the death of Nadab and Abihu do, uh, because you still get chapter 25 following this. So it's, it's still somewhat of an odd placement, now, this argument would probably be stronger if it, if it occurred after instructions for the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee. Uh, but there might be, still be something uh, to say about the relationship between these two narrative sections in the book. <clears throat> One other thing to note just about how the chapter moves. Uh, at the beginning, uh, again, we're in the holy place with the menorah or the lampstands, the lampstand with seven um, lights on it, uh, and the the bread of the presence on the table. We're in the holy place, in the sanctuary, in verses 1 through 9. And then we're actually going to move all the way to the outermost region, outside the camp, where this individual is put to death for blas blasphemy. Blasphemy, that should say verses 1, or I'm sorry, it should say verses 10 through 23 um, there on the, on the PowerPoint slide, uh, as the, this movement from life to death. So again, starts from uh, being in the sanctuary, symbolizing life in the presence of God, moving outward uh, toward the camp where it ends in death. That Again, we talked about that movement in Leviticus before, and we actually see these twin movements on the Day of Atonement with the goats. I uh, remember that one goat is brought inward, um, and that blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people. And that other goat that's selected, the scapegoat, is driven out into the wilderness as the sins are taken out uh, there. And so again, you get these twin movements in chapter 24, as well. Just something to note. But what exactly happens in the chapter? As I've said before, we don't take time to actually read the texts uh, in our lessons together. And so make sure you take time to uh, read these sections in the book of Leviticus as you go through um, these lessons. Uh, it will help you learn to love Leviticus because you'll understand a little bit more about what we're talking about. So what happens in the chapter is this son of an Israelite woman uh, and an Egyptian father, that should say woman, not women, I'm getting a little sloppy with my PowerPoint slides here. The son of an Israelite woman and an Egyptian father. And you might think, well, how does this individual have an Egyptian father? Remember, uh, we're just out of the Exodus here in Leviticus chapter 24. I mean, it feels like it's a long way removed uh, from Passover, but it's actually not. It's like three months removed. Uh, remember that the people um, leave Egypt. They, they cross the Red Sea. Uh, the Egyptians pursue them. They're drowned in the sea. And it takes them three months to get to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up, receives the law, receives the instructions for the tabernacle on Mount Sinai, comes back down. They construct the tabernacle um, at the end of Exodus, and then they consecrate the priests and institute the sacrificial system. And then the glory of the Lord appears in chapter 9. Remember, chapter 9 of Leviticus is a very pivotal chapter in all of Scripture. Uh, because the Lord is once again dwelling in the midst of his people. They're drawing near to him. He is drawn near to them. Now, of course, mediated through this sacrificial system. But there's a sense in which Eden has been restored and the people um, are dwelling once again with God in their midst. And that happens in Leviticus chapter 9, but that's very closely related chronologically to just having come out of Egypt. They've really only been um, 
out of Egypt for about three months. Uh, and so where does this woman and her Egyptian husband come from uh, having this, uh, this son? Well, it's possible that they came out of Egypt married, of course. That's actually likely. But one of the things to note is that Exodus 12, chapter 38, when they're coming out of Egypt, has an interesting statement there. And it says a mixed multitude came up out of Egypt. So apparently, this is easy to miss, but apparently some of the Egyptians actually came out of Egypt with the Israelites, uh, identifying with the Israelite people. Remember, this is all... Um, what's, the, what's the right word, um, preceded, uh, the Exodus is preceded by these 10 plagues uh, that the Lord unleashes upon the Egyptians. And some of these Egyptians apparently saw these plagues, put their faith in Yahweh, and actually leave with the Israelites. A mixed multitude came up according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 38. So we have this Egyptian, I'm sorry, this Israelite woman um, and her Egyptian husband who have a son. And this son fights with another Israelite. And according to verse 11 of Leviticus chapter 24, he blasphemed the name and cursed. Now, there's a, there's a lot of ink spilled on exactly what is uttered here uh, that requires such a, a strong response uh, from the Lord um, and what he requires the people to do in response to this. But apparently, he utters a derogatory curse that involves the use of God's name. Um, using it lightly or with contempt, um, that there's connotations of that with the Hebrew uh, in this. Um, but it's not just that he utters the name. He, he, he degrades the name in some way and, and um, aligns it with some kind of curse so that it's understood as blasphemy. And what we learn from this episode is that God's people must not tolerate blasphemy at all and that God's justice demands that the blasphemer be put to death. And so very stern um, requirement of God's law here in response to what this person does. He blasphemes the name and curses. And that's not to be tolerated. He's to be put to death. And so obviously there's, there's some immediate connections here for us. How we speak of God matters greatly. Of course, how we speak at all matters greatly. That's something taught consistently through the scriptures uh, because uh, it's out of the abundance of our hearts that our mouths speak. And so our mouths reveal what's in our hearts. And of course, what our mouths say about God reveals what we think about God. And so we have to guard uh, our, our words carefully uh, when we're speaking about the Lord and, and how we speak about him. Uh, we must speak and act. Again, there's a connection between the way that we're talking and the way that we're acting. But we must speak and act with a view to upholding God's reputation. First of all, because we're image bearers. Uh, as humans, we are to represent him in some way. Uh, but even more so as his adopted children. Uh, the way we speak and behave says something about who our Heavenly Father is to the watching world. And so it becomes critically important how we use God's name. And of course, this includes the name of Jesus, how we use the name of Jesus, which is the name above all names, before which every knee will bow, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And of course, I don't think I have to make a defense that, or to make, um, to make a case, let's say it that way. I don't think I have to make a case uh, that this is a serious problem in our culture today both inside and outside the church. And we can assume that it would happen outside the church, but the way that we talk about God, the way that we use the title God, the way that we use the name Jesus um, is not altogether uh, holy and fitting, uh, even within the church. And, and certainly in the culture, uh, there's just all kinds of, of uh, vile ways that, that people will take the name of Jesus and take the name of God upon their lips in a very disrespectful, blaspheming kind of a way. Now, of course, we don't exact the death penalty for blasphemers today. And, and I would not make the case that we ought to do that, that, that people who misuse the name of Jesus, who use it flippantly, uh, who really use it as a curse word, which obviously, I mean, people do that. Uh, people use the, 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 the word God as a curse word. Uh, so it's blasphemed often. And I'm not advocating for the death penalty for that blasphemy, but um, we do 
warn against people using it that way. And in opposition to that, we pray that God's name would be hallowed. That's something Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, that um, that our Father's, that our Heavenly Father's name would be something that is hallowed or sanctified. In other words, it's the opposite of being blasphemed. It's that his name would be regarded as holy, set apart, used reverently, respectfully, carefully. Um, but of course, we're taught to pray this, that his name would be hallowed, beginning with us, our own words and our own actions personally and within the church. Um, and so it, it is a grave issue uh, to misuse, to use with contempt, to use lightly, to minimize, to disregard, to dismiss, to blaspheme uh, God and Jesus by name. So we have to be very guarded about how we use those terms. Um, and again, culturally, uh, it is uh, consistently and vilely disrespected. But as Christians in the church, we have to be very much on guard about how we are using it in the way that it's used in our own homes and in our own communities. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't make light of that. It's a very important issue uh, yet today. And we see how important the issue is uh, in Leviticus chapter 24, because again, this person who um, blasphemes the name and curses is to be put to death. Now it's interesting here in Leviticus, I will actually quote this at length, it's in the chapter. Uh, we get what's called the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation, it's a Latin term. Uh, we actually find this first in Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 through 25. Uh, but we find it here in uh, Le Leviticus chapter 24 as well, in verses 17 through 22, in this context of this person blaspheming the name. Let me go ahead and read what it says in Leviticus 24, verses 17 through 22. It says, Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor... As he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. In other words, this, this is a principle that is to characterize the law throughout the land, whether the native or the sojourner. Um, and basically... Uh, when it talks about animal, an animal's life shall make it good, it means that you repay that person for that loss. Uh, if you kill a person's horse, you repay it with a horse. You lose a horse for the horse that you killed. Um, human life, of course, is different. You take a human life, you, you forfeit your life. Now, we talked about this a while back, death penalty kinds of stuff, um, having to be careful with that. But basically, the principle is let the punishment fit the crime. That whatever the crime is, the punishment should be suitable for that. So part of this is protective, actually, that you don't uh, take a life for an eye. You take an eye for an eye, and you don't take an eye for a tooth. You take a tooth for a tooth. And so there is this let the punishment be fitting for the crime that's been committed, but there's also something protective in this. Derek Tidball in his commentary on Leviticus says, Justice was to be based on the principle of exact reciprocity. The law was also designed to set a limit on the punishments meted out to check the unleashing of vengeance and to forestall the igniting of spirals of retaliation. In other words, just things getting worse and worse and worse because people are taking revenge. And of course, when revenge happens, nobody thinks that it's, it's even, right? The person who exacted revenge always went one step further than what was actually just. And so then, then the person um, that experienced that revenge takes revenge uh, on top of that, and then that person perceives that it went over the top, and there's just this constant cycle of vengeance being taken, and no one feels that it's even. And again, what, what I said before, Tidball says, if an eye was lost, no one had the right to take a life in return. The punishment had to be equal to the crime, not more, and not less. And so, again, there, there, there's a balance here, right? The law of reciprocity, or uh, the law of retaliation, let the punishment be fitting for the crime which means don't exceed what justice would require, but don't diminish what justice would require either. But here, here's the important thing, right? It's interesting that this lex talionis appears right here in Leviticus chapter 24, because here's how the chapter ends. 
So Moses spoke, this is the, this is the next verse after the Lex Talionis passage that runs from verses 17 through 22. Here's verse 23. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and, uh, I'm sorry, they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. And thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Again, so what's the point? How do we wrap our minds around this? Well, it's interesting again that the Lex Talionis is presented right here in this context. And then it's, it's in the context in which a person is put to death for blasphemy. And what that's telling us is that fits the crime, that what blasphemy deserves is death. And again, this is something that um, would be quickly dismissed in our culture. Wow, to misuse the name of the Lord, uh, to use it lightly, um, to use it in a derogatory or disrespectful manner. That can't be any big deal whatsoever. We hear it every day. We hear it in entertainment. We hear it uh, in, in music that we listen to, in movies that we watch, in television programming. But the reality is scripturally, blasphemy, to use God's name lightly with contempt and disrespectfully, deserves death. But here's the good news. We can repent and be forgiven of blasphemy. Um, and so there is a way out of death through repentance and forgiveness. Uh, we know there's forgiveness for blasphemy because in 1 Timothy chapter 1.13, Paul, the apostle, acknowledges that he once was a blasphemer. Remember that he persecuted the church of Christ Jesus. And, and really, it's probably he has in mind, well, he has in mind perhaps not just the blasphemy of Israel's God, but the blasphemy of Jesus, whom he was persecuting and the persecuting of the church. And so Paul acknowledges that he was once a blasphemer, but he is forgiven. Um, so we don't read of any kind of repentance on the part of this person. So maybe even this person could have been spared, but we know that we can be spared uh, for ways that we utter the name of God, the name of Jesus in inappropriate and sinful ways through repentance. And we can be forgiven because here's the amazing thing. Jesus was condemned in our place. In Mark chapter 14, 64, one of the accusations and charges that's levied against him by the Jewish people is that he's guilty of blasphemy. And so he takes our blasphemy upon himself so that we can be forgiven. Of course, he takes all of our sins upon himself for those who look to Jesus by faith and trust in him for salvation. There is forgiveness uh, for all of our sins, including the sin of blasphemy, except in one instance, and that's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which Jesus says will not be forgiven in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Now, of course, that takes us into the New Testament, uh, and that's not part of of learning to love Leviticus necessarily. So although that's a complex question about what exactly is meant by blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I'm actually not going to tackle that in this lesson. Uh, maybe, maybe some other time. If you have questions about it, uh, maybe you can contact me and we can have a dialogue about that. But basically, in the context, there is this attributing the works and words of Jesus that are um, given by power of the Holy Spirit. There's this attributing them to the work of the devil. So there's this attribution of the Spirit's work to, to Satan, or Beelzebub, as, as the context would suggest, um, and that's, that's a problem. But there's this persistent conclusion that's drawn at this point by the Pharisees as well. So context of Matthew 12 makes a big difference. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. I might, might have even raised more questions than, than I answered by saying that here at the end. Uh, but there, there is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit mentioned in Matthew 12. Uh, verse 31, that's, that's worthy of note. Uh, but the good news is that um, we th there is forgiveness uh, when we repent and trust in Jesus who was condemned in our place. And so that gets us through Leviticus chapter 24. Again, we come back to issues of sacred time. That was the, uh, the topic of Leviticus chapter 23. We come back to that in Leviticus chapter 25 next time, where we have uh, both the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year to look at. So uh, we'll pick up with Leviticus 25 next time. Hopefully you'll join us then. God bless.